link on the stream page, yes, sorry. Uh, okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Thank you, online students, for joining us. Welcome to our in-person students um, and also to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture uh, later on. Um, so this morning, I will begin with um, uh, sharing a few of uh, the reformers, revivalists uh, uh, from our publication. Those of you who shared yesterday, uh, last week, sorry, um, I'll just uh, mention a few important things and then we'll move on to the class presentations it's because uh, some of our online students said they wanted me to, uh, you know, uh, explain um, those reformers or revivalists um, that were presented last week. So I'm going to do that um, in the beginning and then we'll go on with our presentation. And then if you have time, I'll continue to, uh, you know, um, uh, share the the other revivalists and reformers that were uh, presented to us okay so we'll begin with a word of prayer i'll ask diksha to lead us in prayer please let's pray father god we thank you for this time lord thank you for the class lord that we are going to have lord lord open our hearts and minds to understand your word in more deeper way lord jesus lord Lord, your Holy Spirit will take control over each one of us, Lord. We bring our minds, Lord, before you, Lord. We just want to focus on your word, Lord, that we're going to learn, Lord. And we surrender our faculties in your hand, Lord, as they are going to teach us, Lord. Give them more wisdom, more knowledge, Lord. For they will teach us in a right way, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Lord, you help us, those who want to present, those who are going to do the presentation, Lord. Lord, give them more understanding, Lord. And your help, Lord, we ask over them, Lord. Thank you for this time, Lord. We give glory, honor to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So we look at uh, uh, Edward Iring, uh, 40, uh, page number 46. Uh, Edward began his ministry as a Presbyterian minister, the Church of Scotland, and he led a congregation of around 50 people, but that grew to a thousand members within just a few months. And why was that? Because Edward, you know, studied the book of Acts and he was um, convinced that, you know, the church, uh, the, the early church should be like the prototype, was a prototype for the church today. Okay, the church today should be like the early church where there is unity, oneness, there's preaching, the word, there's teaching of the word and also signs, miracles and wonders and uh, flowing in the uh, manifestations and the gifts of the uh, spirit okay so he challenged people to believe that whatever happened in acts should also happen during their time and their day okay so there was manifestation of the holy spirit um, tongues prophecy healings began to take place and he encouraged the lay people to exercise the gifts of the spirit and this was something that was very new uh, for the presbyterian church and um, the church board and um, they did not like this um, and also he uh, you know um, uh, uh, edward iring he not only emphasized on the deity of christ that jesus christ is god but also emphasized on his Im humanity and how as a human being he was empowered by the holy spirit and he lived a sinless life and he was able to do those mighty works because of the power of the Holy Spirit and his teachings and, you know, the way that he was following what was a prototype in the early church, you know, is branded as a heretic and uh, he was expelled from the Presbyterian church and the Scottish church as well. And but he continued to do his ministry, you know, and he freely exercised the gifts of the spirit. And um, even as people were, you know, excited, uh, there was very limited knowledge in, in those days about uh, the manifestation of the gifts to spread, how to move in it, how to flow in it. Even today when we have so much of more knowledge compared to uh, the earlier times or the earlier days, there is still sometimes, right, a lot of um, um, 
uh, uh, fleshly manifestation. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding of the uh, gifts of the spirit, and that is also what happened uh, during Edward's um, time. Okay, so there was no proper leadership. There was no mature guidance, um, um, and you know people went in different directions, and so people also started to uh, manifest in the flesh okay and so it was also misunderstood as a manifestation of the spirit okay so we see that you know there was a lot of problems regarding this but anyways the church was growing uh, because of the move of the holy spirit and the manifestation of the um, gifts so even as we take um, you know um, we, you are learning about the person work of the holy spirit and even as some of you take uh, you know go back to your church uh, churches and uh, you know take these teachings um, and uh, the move of the Holy Spirit, how to operate in the gift of the Spirit. It's important that you even before you uh, teach people to manifest the gift of the Spirit, teach them what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what is speaking in tongues, how to flow in the gifts, how to do it in an orderly manner. Just like you know um, uh, Paul taught the church at. Corinth. Okay, so it's important that we not only um, just be excited to flow in the gifts and the manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but it's important that we also teach. Okay, now many people have told me, you know, people in our churches will not accept it. Uh, well, we've seen over the period of time in his church history how people have accepted the gifts of the Spirit and how you know people are flowing in the gifts today. Okay, and how churches are receiving that. It's important that we teach them when we are sure, when we are convinced, when we teach them, the Holy Spirit will move. Okay. Um, so that was Edward Eyring. And, um, you know, uh, he was commended for his desire and willingness for the outpouring and the manifestation of the Spirit. I think he was quite a bold man, challenge in, and it was a move the Holy Spirit in his day, in his time, when none of them around him were doing that, you know, to just um, uh, believe in what he read in the book of Acts and thought that it should also be the kind of church that was there during his time, okay? Then uh, Titus Cohen, um, a revival in Hawaii. He and his wife um, went to Hawaii from United States in 1835, and he preached in the Hilo Island. And in 1837, there was revival fires that began to ignite. People were stirred up, and crowds grew to 15,000 in attendance you know and there was a two-year camp meeting that means people were just living in camps and at any given time there were two thousand to six thousand people present in those camps okay just imagine this is what we call a revival right when people just come people are just pursuing the presence of god people are just there look at uh, you know the two-year camp a meeting anytime there were at least 2,000 to 6,000 people and it's not the work of man this is something very characteristic of revival and the word that he spoke felt like fire and hammer fire and hammer means what the word of God is compared to fire and it's hammer why fire why is the word of God compared to a fire what does a fire do burns what else Burn down the chaff of the life. Okay, it burns down the chaff. What else a fire does? It yes, purifies. it purifies. Thank you, Gordon. Yes, it purifies, right? When you put metal, gold, you know, for purity, it's extreme heat, you know, and then, you know, get you, you get pure metal, okay? And uh, so the word of God is like fire. It just burned up, you know, the sin, the dross, the filth, everything that's of fleshly, carnal nature. And how is the word of God like a hammer? It breaks, right? When you take a hammer and you, you, you hit it on something, it breaks, okay? It breaks a hard heart, heart of stone, okay? And it causes people to just accept the um, gospel, okay? So we see that lives were transformed in just this two-year period. You know, um, uh, Titus, uh, you know, so many people were added to the church that his church became the largest congregation in the world back then, okay? And uh, there was, uh, churches grew to nearly 60 self-supporting churches. Um, and, you know, there were native pastors there and a membership of about 15,000 
people. Okay, look at what Cohen, uh, uh, what was his statement or motto in life? To die in the field with an armor on with weapons bright. Okay, so that was his his vision, that was his motto. Remember, uh, some of these uh, revivalists or uh, reformers that we read about, they all had a motto, a saying. Uh, you know, Amy Kaima uncle we see here, says you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And the Smith Wigglesworth here, I'm not moved by what I see or by what I feel. I'm only moved by what I believe. So these are all like, you know, uh, visions that these people had. You know what the word of God says, without vision, people perish. I think I, we should write a vision statement for our own lives, right? Others will be walking aimlessly in life. So if you come to our Bible college online students, you know, uh, e-learning students, you will see all of these great uh, reformers, revivalists, their, um, uh, you know, uh, their Im pics and, you know, their names and, you um, uh, where they went as missionaries and one of their, uh, you know, uh, their mottos or their uh, vision statements is there hanging um, uh, in every place in the in the Bible college. And it's very encouraging to read them. So here Cohen says to die in the field with armor on, with weapons bright. OK, that means he's always ready, fighting his battle, engaging in the battle against the enemy always there on his uh, feet, ready to um, uh, do the work of the gospel, okay? Uh, George Muller, um, you know, he started off as, um, uh, you know, started, he and his wife started caring for uh, 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 orphan children. There were 30 girls in his own rented home, and then it moved on to like 10,000 uh, orphans, both uh, boys and girls, and his... Um, uh, you know, um, motto in life was, you know, he said, I've joyfully dedicated my whole life to the object of exemplifying how much uh, may be accomplished by prayer and faith. Okay. So this was his whole motto in life. Okay. He's joyfully dedicated his whole life and he wants to exemplify that people can do things through what? Through what? Prayer yeah. and Faith, yes. So he exemplified that in his own life. He never asked for funds. He never wrote to anybody. He never asked anybody, you know, but he just prayed. And every time he prayed, you know, you know, the children were just fed with food. There's one time when uh, there was no breakfast for them, but he got all the children to sit on the dining table and just pray. And after they finished their prayer, you know, uh, a baker come, rings the bell and he brings uh, bread for the children. He said he was led the previous night. Maybe God stirred up his heart, not maybe God stirred up his heart to make bread and to give to the orf uh, orphanage. And also uh, there was a milkman who was carrying milk, you know, to be delivered. And his uh, a cart, bullock cart, you know, whatever, you know, or horse cart just um, broke down right in front of the orphanage. So he decided to give the milk to the orphanage. So the children had bread and milk for breakfast. There were many other instances like um, that. Uh, so we see that, you know, um, reformers, many of them were great men and women of prayer, right? Even revivalists. We know that one of the main characteristic of birthing revival is what? What is the main ingredient for birthing revival? Prayer. prayer and acting. Yes, prayer and also intimacy with um, with God, right? So we see in his lifetime, he had 1,500,000 pounds that was just given to his uh, orphanage without him even asking. He also established 117 um, schools. Amazing work with just prayer and faith. So if you want to start orphanages, if you're, uh, you know, doing any work of the Lord, just uh, remember that it's just prayer and faith. I remember, you know, when before I joined APC, I was with one organization. We started um, a, a project for teens. And um, I'm not somebody who um, uh, likes to stretch out my hand and ask anybody for anything, specifically when it comes to money. But here for this project, we had to write to different people because we had a, 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 an organization funding us, but it was very good because they were saying that we will give you 50% of the funds 
and to the matching funds that you raise up. So if we raise up 5,000, they will also give us 5,000, right? So it was matching. If we raise 10,000, they'll give us 10,000. So the responsibility also lies on us. So we had to ask people, we had to write to people. And I was someone who was feeling very uncomfortable because I'm not somebody who likes to ask people, especially for money. Okay, that's something that I just totally detest. I can use the word detest. Yes. But I was here and I had to ask and I had to do. So what I did was I just used to send emails and letters, but I never followed up with people, whether they receive my emails, whether they receive my letters i just prayed and god miraculously just met the funds because it is his work it is what he has begun and he is the one who will provide for us right so i think that is something very encouraging that we can learn also and remember from george muller's life the next one is 1839 william chalmers burns so revivalist and scottish missionary to uh, china um uh, after his, he accepted Christ in 1831, he decided to serve the Lord. And, um, you know, um, uh, he was preaching in his church in Scotland uh, in 1839. There was an unusual season of revival that broke out and almost everyone in his town turned to the Lord. That is a revival, right? A revival is when communities are just brought into the uh, kingdom of God, okay? And soon, you know, um, God was using him as a revivalist across Scotland. But his heart was to take the gospel uh, to those who never had a chance to hear. So what was his life goal? Uh, you can read that. It says on, uh, on page number 47, it says, The longing of my heart would be to go once around the world before I die and preach one gospel invitation in the year of every creature. Okay, so I think that is so important to have a vision and a goal. Please write down your vision statement. Please write down your goals in life. Otherwise, you will walk through life aimlessly. You will be doing things, but you will say, hey, I never achieved much. Okay, uh, pray, fast, pray, write down your vision, your goal, and, and you know, pursue that. And God, uh, just, you know, say, God, this is my vision, my goal. I'm just giving it to you. I want you to you know, rework on it, whatever you want to, so that I can align my will to your will. And it's nice to have that so that you can keep looking back at it. Otherwise, if you don't have a vision, life can become a real burden, okay? Even if you're doing ministry, you will not be able to enjoy it. Uh, you will not be able to go forward. Um, and it will just be like frustrating, uh, okay? So it's important to write your vision statement. So we see that here he was, his vision was to at least preach the gospel, um, you know, and go around the world to every creature, okay? And um, in 1847, he went to um, Hong Kong, and he later preached in various places in Hong Kong, and he met Hudson Taylor, and Hudson Taylor says that he was greatly impressed uh, by um, uh, Burns' life, and he was one of his mentors, uh, spiritual mentors. He, uh, Byrne was um, a spiritual mentor to Hudson Taylor, and Hudson Taylor testifies to his prayer life. Okay, So these great men and women of God who did great things were people of great uh, prayer life, strong prayer life. Okay, So for 20 years, he served in China, uh, and he died after a short um, illness. Okay, And one of William Byrne's well-known quotes was, always be ready. Okay, from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Um, and then is David Livingston, a missionary to Africa. Uh, basically, he, um, you know, um, uh, his, he said that if, you know, if men want to come and join him, then if you have men who will come only, if there's a good road, I don't want them. I want strong, courageous men who will come even if there is no road okay that means even if the journey is tough and hard he wants strong brave courageous men to um, join him okay and then you can read his uh, quote there you know um, um david livingston he says you know if you look at uh, page number 47 uh, you can read his quote but i'm not going to read it i'm just going to explain what he basically says basically david livingston is expressing that his work in africa is often seen by others as a sacrifice, but he says it's not a true sacrifice, but it's a privilege, 
Okay, why is it a privilege? Because he says that you know it is just a small part of the great debt owing to our God. The big things that God has done for his life, even salvation, page number 47, salvation, what God has given to him is what he is doing is not a sacrifice, it's just something very small compared to what uh, great things that God has done in his um, life. Okay, so he says that, you know, uh, it's a privilege to serve God. And he argues that serving God by spreading uh, goodness, helping others and pursuing a noble pro, uh, purpose in life brings immense personal rewards such as peace of mind and hope for eternal reward. And David Livingston believes that any service done for God is nothing compared to the immense debt you know, humanity owes to him for what he has done. So he said it should be seen as a joy, not a, as a burden, right? Uh, ministering, serving the Lord, um, you know, even if we are uh, not serving the Lord, but we are uh, born again people in the workplace, in the world, it's difficult to live our testimony. It's difficult to, you know, uh, follow God. It's very challenging, but it should be seen as a joy, not as a burden, right? When I was preparing this, 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 this uh, phrase really struck me, you know, serving God should be seen as a joy, not a burden. Sometimes when we are overwhelmed with tasks in ministry, it can become so burdensome that we lose out on the joy. And I was just telling myself yesterday, you know, it should look at it as a joy, not as a burden. Okay. So he was a reformer, David Livingston, who brought about social change in Africa. Um, uh, he was not just spreading uh, Christianity, or you know, but he also uh, helped in abolishing slave trade, um, you know, uh, which he saw was very prevalent in Africa. And it was his deep conviction that commerce, that means trade, you know, Christianity and civilization were key to ending the exploitation of slavery in, um, in, in Africa. Okay. Um, okay. Then... Um, we'll move on to uh, 1859... Some of you presented that um, is the revival in yeah page number forty eight revival in uh, Ulster province, Northern um, Ireland. Okay, so um, there was a revival that was that had broke out in New York, and the church in Ireland was so stirred up for or hungry for revival that in September 1857, four young men, you know, in Ulster, Northern Ireland, they committed to praying for revival. So even as some of you read, uh, you know, this or go through this course, you might, you know, be uh, impressed in your heart or the Holy Spirit can stir your heart to pray for revival in your place. So even as you do that, you know, revival can break out. So you see that this, this four young men, you know, they just prayed for uh, revival. They were so, um, uh, uh, you know, excited about the revival that was happening in New York. They were committed to praying for revival. And, um, uh, you know, that started uh, in 1858. And towards the early 1859, many prayer groups started praying for revival in uh, in um, in, in Ireland, right? And then, um, so more than, you know, uh, uh, 104 prayer groups started all over the city, in one city in Ulster, and they were praying almost night and day for um, a revival. And James, one of them, the one of the four, organized a prayer meeting in 1859, and that was attended by 300 people. They were standing in the mud and rain, and they were just gripped by the power of the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay, and during the message, uh, there was a layman who was preaching, but 100 people fell to the ground under the conviction of sin. They were just crying, they conf confessed their sins to God. So, all this is just, you know, um, things that happened during um, a revival. Okay, so the revival fire that was ignited began to spread in homes, in the marketplaces. And the whole town was convicted by the power of, uh, under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. So this is characteristic of revival, how the Holy Spirit moves and just reaches out in the community, in the homes, in the um, families. Okay. Um, 
and people were meeting everywhere for prayer and uh, there was a great f uh, strong physical manifestation that was there seen among men women even uh, children and children prayed with great uh, prayer and this revival spread to various countries uh, there was a, there, there's a factory in uh, uh, Brookshane which was closed for two days because 20 of its workers were convicted by the Holy Spirit. They just lie, lie there, lay down on the floor crying out to uh, God. Okay, And there was a fair that was happening, country fair, uh, what we call in India as a mela or, you know, that was happening, uh, you know, and 5,000 people were there. That fair that Mela turned into a prayer meeting, right? And homes and families were just uh, restored and lives were uh, changed. And look at the, the uh, you know, uh, the, the move of revival, the characteristics of revival that was happening here. Okay. So just everywhere the Holy Spirit was working, even in a fair, even in a Mela that was there, 5,000 people were touched. Uh, the, you know, homes and families were restored, lives were changed, and a, a large distillery, uh, you know, um, uh, producing alcohol, you know, was closed, whiskey trade dropped, alcohol trade uh, dropped, pubs were closed, you know, judges had no cases to try because there was no, nobody involved in crime, okay, there were no prisoners in custody. Can you imagine, you know, and um, this revival spread uh, to other places in and around Ireland. And people came from England, Scotland, and other parts of uh, Ireland to see what God was doing. And an estimated of, you know, one lakh people or 100,000 people joined the church. So if you want to uh, know what are the features of revival, this is one characteristic of revival, the revival in Ulster province in um, Ireland. Revival in, uh, prayer revival in Wales, like what was happening in Ireland, people in Wales also engaged in prayer ac across the country. And God used two men, Humphrey and David, and uh, they brought about revival through their preaching. Many of them were saved, children were touched. And revival broke out in about 40 coal mines. There were 40, uh, coal mines in Wales, 40 coal mines. Can you imagine 40 coal mines, how many people working there? Revival broke out. And, um, um, and the ministries and churches were revived across Wales. I think we need to pray for revival. What a move of God in the uh, 19th century in these places. You know, um, uh, and now if you look at this, these same places, in US, you know, um, Europe, um, England, churches are so dead. All the churches are closed down. Now those churches have been sold to people uh, who use it as pubs. And it's very, very um, sad, right? So I think we need to pray that God would birth revival in these places and there will be a mighty move. And in 1860, there was a revival in Scotland and England when news of what was happening in North America, in Ireland, reached Scotland. The church in Scotland began to pray. And I think it's important that as churches, as by, you know, students in the Bible college, just pray for revival, right? You have Friday prayer, pray for revival. God can birth revival, right? Um, even in your home prayer groups, or if you're leading prayer groups, pray for revival. I think we need it uh, more than ever before, right? Because the coming of the Lord is soon, the rapture is soon. We need to pray for um, a revival, okay? So the revival broke out in Scotland. People began to pray and ask God for an outpouring. And in the Presbyterian Church, um, uh, around 40,549 people were reported to attend weekly prayer for revival. They were just praying for revival. So this was almost 40,000 people meeting together to pray for revival in a weekly prayer. In addition, there were 1,205 prayer meetings. Imagine different prayer meetings everywhere. And there were 129 interdenominational prayer meetings. That means denominations came together to pray for revival how powerful right how the move of the holy spirit how brings he brings everyone in that uh, city to just pray and the results of course has to be amazing right when there's unity and um, oneness so similar to the revivals in ulster and wales so, um, scotland so around 
300,000 uh, people saved. There were about 650,000 uh, people saved across England. The impact of the revival was so great that, if, uh, you know, evangelism, missions, and social work, you know, reached the all-time new high. Okay, and in 1860 was a year where revivals were reported even in other parts of the world, including South Africa and Jamaica and other places. Okay, and we see many a rise of many theologians and preachers that helped uh, to to you know take on the work of God and what God was doing in America and United Kingdom. So you see what and all was a result of an. Uh, revival, right? There was no crimes. Judges were free. Police were free. Uh, you know, pubs were shut down. And I think we need to pray that, especially in our uh, city in Bangalore. It's also called a pub city, right? You know, it's so many pubs just flourishing. Uh, people as uh, children as young as 14, 13 years, you know, going to pubs. We need to just pray for a revival in um, Bangalore city as uh, well. Okay. So that was. Um, the, the the revival moves that happen in Wales, Scotland, England, and um, Ireland. Okay, um, I'll stop here, um, and I'll we'll uh, look at the others so that you're not listening to my monotonous voice. Uh, we'll have now people presenting, and then I will come back and um, uh, share. Okay. So don't be afraid. Uh, you nobody is here in front of you. You just have to look at the you know the the camera and just speak your heart out like I do every, every time. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just encouraging you. So uh, don't be afraid. Just think nobody is there and just speak. Okay. Um, and if you're nervous, just read from your notes. That will just help everyone and there'll be more uh, clarity. Okay, so today we have... Um, uh, Yeah, Deepu R, uh, last week you were unwell. Would you like to present, Deepu? Are you there? Ma'am, I'm there, but still I have some throat issues, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you won't be able to even speak for five minutes? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Divya Darshini, I thought she had asked for... Uh, permission not to speak. Okay, Kofi. Kofi, are you there? Do you like to present? Yes, please. Thank you. Can we see you, Kofi, if you don't mind? You can put your video or everything. Good morning to you all. My presentation is going to be on Korean Revival in 1907 and 1908 to 1911 Revival in Manchuria, North China. And then the third one will be 1909 Willis Hoover and the Pentecostal Revival in Chile. South America. I'll start with 1907 Korean Revival. About 117 years ago, a revival began, began in Korea on one Saturday night in January 1907. At this meeting, Presbyterian missionary where William Blay preached to thousands of Koreans focusing on their need to turn away from hatred of the Japanese, whom Korea had a conflict with. At this meeting were missionaries and Korean Christians who had been praying for the outpour of the Holy Spirit for revival and repentance. On that Saturday, many began praying aloud and signs of awakening 
began to appear. A missionary described it as the falling of many waters and an ocean of prayer beating against God's throne. As the prayer continued, a spirit of heaven, a spirit of heavy and sorrow for sin came down upon them. After this, they started confessing their sins. The meeting went on until 2 o'clock a.m. with confession and weeping and praying. But these are the signs of revival and it also shows a sign of repentance which we can identify in times of revival. In general, the focus and grief and confession sins, sins of ethnic hatred, in particular, suggests to me that this was revival in which the spirit was indeed moved. Before this revival, there had been a number of revival, one in 1903, one another in 19, 1905, but this particular revival in 1907 had a tremendous turn in the whole land of Korea, a city called Pijil, which is now the capital of North Korea was one known to be Jerusalem of the East and others also call that place Jerusalem of Asia because of the revival that took place. A brother named Andrews said something I would like to end this with. Our prayer can go where we cannot. There are no bodies, no prison walls, no doors that are close to us when we pray. This is a quote from this great friend of us. Then to the next one, revival in Machiria, North China. China, the material revival was spoken by Jonathan Goofus. He's the one who spoke. He was, he lived in 1959, uh, 1859 to 1936. The wife was Rosalind, who also lived in 1864 to 1946. In 1907, they also had that encounter at Korea. They were there and they read a quite a number of books. Finished lecture on revival. They read it. And then in 1904 and 1905, they also read another book. So this book that they read changes them to pray and wait for revival. The revival came and it was characterized by much repentance and turning away from sin. From this time, Jonathan became essential an evangelist and an evangelist and revivalist in North China, Michelin. And then to 1909, Willis Hoover, and the Pentecostal revival in Chile, South America. A missionary named Minnie Abrams 
was an American Methodist missionary. She was an American Methodist missionary who lived in 1859 to 1912. A classmate of Mary Ann, Mary Ann Hoover, the husband of Willis Hoover, Charles. This missionary had an account an encounter in China, and he wrote whatever transpired there. She sent a copy of what happened there to the friend who is a classmate, Mary Ann. Mary Ann Hoover then shared it with the husband. They read it. And then as they keep on reading, reading the account of their, reading the account of the eyewitness, their appetite were wet and they began to appeal to God for a similar revival. They instituted prayer, special prayer meeting for revival in their Methodist church. They were all Methodist missionaries. They instituted that prayer meeting in their Methodist church. Lo and behold, the day of revival came and the Holy Spirit convicted Conviction came and confession of sins followed with some making restitution for former wrongdoing. That Saturday night, July 4th, 1909, heaven opened and revival broke out with tremendous power as described by Charles Hoover. In all this, their appetite for the Holy Spirit brought about that revival that they were seeking for. Amen. Thank you very much, Kofi. Good job. Can we clap for Kofi? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, this revival in Manchuria, North, Northern China, uh, Jonathan Goforth, we see that one of the important outcomes of this revival was it helped raise leadership within uh, the Chinese church, right? And um, so that is very, very important. We see there's a lot of uh, reformers and revivalists that went to China, right? But now in China, we know that there's so much of hindrance for the work of the gospel uh, people are more pursuing not god there is no concept of god in their lives it's more about economy uh, money and uh, power so we need to pray for revival also in china there's so many people who gave their lives who went there and ministered okay and um, yeah so uh, what did you learn about uh, these revivalists kofi Anything that you learn, what is some application that we can take? Um, can you please come again? Uh, what is some of the learnings that you learned and uh, you know how, what can we learn about revival from these uh, three uh, things that you shared? Did you get my question, Kofi? I can't hear you. Sorry, we can't hear you. Your, your audio is not good there. And their audio is not good. Yeah. Uh. Now, can you hear me?
How can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Uh, yes, Kofi, can you speak something? Unmute your mic, please. No, but we can't hear you. Uh, none of us can hear you. Uh, we can't hear you, Kofi. Can the other students hear Kofi? No? no, sister. No, okay. Okay, no worries, Kofi. We'll come back to you later. Uh, we'll move on to the next person. Uh, the next person is Komal. You want to come here, Komal? Come. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today uh, we will go through three topics. And first one is revival in China, 1927 to 1939. Uh, we see about this one. So in 1907, a Pentecostal missionary became active in China from many other places, foreign missionaries came to China and they uh, did uh, their work in China. And after that, till 1927, there was no any, we can't see any, a revival there but after 1927 we see that Santang revival broke out so in that uh, revival we see that that uh, this revival had a profound spiritual impact on Chinese Christian community and missionaries effort at the time saving the growth of church in China in a powerful way and that time was very critical time because there were many conflicts between nationalist and communist and anti-Christian sentiment was uh, rising in that time. And we see many uh, presence of missionary at that time. Till that time, there was no work. Miss uh, conversion was very low. People were transforming their life very uh, that low was there. But uh, after that, uh, when this uh, Revival broke out. We see the key figures of Santang revival was like Mary Monson, this the uh, center figure of this re Santang revival. She was a Norwegian Lutheran missionaries with the ch uh, China Island Mission. Monson Monson arrived in China in 1901, and by 1920s she became known for deep spiritual life and her emphasis on prayer, the Holy Spirit, and personal repentance. Monson believed that uh, many church members, including missionaries and Chinese Christians, had not experienced genuine conversion and spiritual renewal. She began urging believers to examine their hearts, seek, seek the filling of the Holy Spirit, and li live lives of holiness and repentance. And after that, many Chinese leaders came out for the revival. Many local pastors came out for the revival and it spread all the in that area. In many places, in many cities it spread. And we can see the uh, characteristic of uh, scientific revival was like mainly they focused on prayer and confession of sin. And uh, because of that, many people got transferred in their life and also they depended on Holy Spirit. They saw the power of Holy Spirit. Many people reported supernatural experience such as dreams, vision, healings, and prophetic words. There was a deep hunger for presence of God, and many experienced that what they described as a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit. And also we see the indigenous growth. This local pastor came out from uh, stand for that revival. They came out and many people christian people they transformed their heart they in reality in genuine way they came out and they believe god 
and uh, we can see the impact of that certain revival was the church growth as well as protestant and as well as catholic churches we saw uh, them increasing in numbers many numbers and uh, it strengthened the indigenous chinese christianity and also we can see a uh, role of women there and we can learn from this ending revival this revival that happened during 1927 to 1939 uh, we can learn from this one that the power of prayer and repentance that uh, it teaches us the importance of prayer humility confession of sin in the life of church true revival begins when the believers are willing to humble themselves admit their sins and seek god and also we can learn to depend uh, on holy spirit when we depend on holy spirit uh, holy when holy spirit will work it will work differently and uh, We will go for a break. We will continue next class.